Welcome to CVL's first virtual brown bag series. Let me take a moment to orient you to this new virtual format. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A. We will make time to answer questions from the Q&A at the end, but you can ask your questions at any point during the presentation. Now we'll introduce our first speaker, our own Chandra Malika Basak. Dr. Basak completed her master, bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Calcutta in India before earning an additional master's degree and PhD from Syracuse University. She then completed a postdoc at the Be Beckman Institute and started as an assistant professor at Rice University before joining the CVL and UTD in 2011. She'll be telling us about some of her new work focused on cardiovascular health and aging. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Basak. Thank you, Kendra. Is it okay for me to start talking now? Okay, great. Thank you, Kendra, um, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to you all about this uh, relatively new line of research that we have been doing since last one and a half years. Um, so I'll be uh, going over three different experiments uh, where we have tried to focus on cardiovascular health as a potential protective factor against age related declines that we see in executive functioning. Um, so the background and rationale for doing these studies was, um, you know, we know that there are steep cognitive deficits and executive functions and working memory, and this is not only seen in adults with um, mild cognitive impairment, but also with uh, in adults with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but most importantly, uh, this marked decline um, in uh, executive functions and working memory is seen across um, adult lifespan, particularly in healthy aging. Um, so the meta analysis uh, that if you are interested, you can look at for healthy aging. The Bob and Verhagen 20, um, sorry, 2016 um, is the one on working memory uh, using NBAC tasks, and then the Vosilation et al. 2011 is looking at different types of task switching paradigms and establishing that there are um, age-related deficits. Um, specific to working memory and multitasking abilities in older adults that could not be explained by general speed of processing. Um, so as we know, one of the biggest deficits that we see as we get older is that our information processing speed declines and that contributes to about 90% um, of the variance in age related deficits and many um, um, tasks that require you to respond very rapidly. Uh, but what has been of interest for most of us who are in the field of cognitive aging is to hunt for that rest 10% and see uh, what are the main uh, you know, players in those 10%. So working memory and executive functions um, are labeled to be the next main player after the processing speed and episodic memory being the third. Um, there are also meta there are also studies that have compared um, MCI and uh, uh, MCI adults and adults with, with Alzheimer's disease and tried to see uh, whether these deficits are marked in those groups and also in one of the study by Kurova et al. they compared across all the three groups. So uh, given that um, this, these deficits are observed um, as early as in healthy aging, it is therefore important to study the modifying effects of the protective factors on these uh, executive function processes. So cardiovascular health is argued to be one such protective factor against aging, with both physical fitness and arterial wall plasticity being independently associated with reduced age-related deficits in executive functions and working memory. So um, I'm going to turn on my pointer so everybody can see. Um, so uh, physical exercise, for example, uh, a training on physical exercise is found to attenuate cognitive declines in older adults. If you're interested, you can look at meta-analysis and healthy aging by Falk et al. Really cool meta-analysis, recent one in 2019, where they looked at different types of physical exercise and their effects on not only cognition, but also on uh, physical parameters. And they also looked at correlation between how much benefits from the physical exercise training do you have in cognition as well uh, and correlated it with how much benefit do you have in physical health parameters. Um, so, so this is a really cool meta-analysis. I was very impressed reading it. And then there is the classic Calcomb et al. in 2003, which was one of the first meta-analysis to show that in healthy aging, physical exercise training has a beneficial effect. 
Um, some recent analysis have also looked at um, mild cognitive impairment and found that physical exercise training can also attenuate cognitive declines in uh, these uh, group of older adults. Uh, however, even though the physical exercise attenuates cognitive declines in general, because many times when people do meta-analysis, they look at overall cognition. Um, however, in Calcom and Kramer 2003, they looked at different types of um, cognition and they found that the largest effects of physical exercise training was on executive functions. So there has been a lot of interest in um, at least understanding the behavioral effects of physical exercise on um, age-related deficits um, on the modifiable effects of physical exercise on age-related deficits and executive functions. Um, in addition to uh, the effects of physical exercise, um, studies of behavioral studies have also found that older hypertensive patients tend to have worse performance in executive function tasks. Um, although these independent effects um, of fitness and um, hypertension um, or arterial rigidity in some sense, uh, both being indicators of cardiovascular health on executive functions and working memory have been studied in um, healthy aging. Little is known about the combined effects of uh, fitness and arterial wall plasticity on executive functions. Um, let alone the behavioral effects, um, the neural mechanisms of these protective factors on brain aging are also unclear. Um, so what are executive functions? It's our ability to plan and execute goal-oriented tasks in everyday life, um, such as, for example, for many of us who were here today for the flu shot this morning, we were driving after a long time. For me, I was driving really after a long time, and then I was coming to um, you know, CBL and I had to plan the day and activity so that you know I could reorient myself to driving or relatively infrequent activity coming to CBL and then arranging and organizing my day so that I get my flu shots effectively and then prepare for my presentation and uh, you know successfully complete the presentation. Um, so the activities of these uh, these kind of activities require planning and and these are all goal oriented tasks that we use in everyday life. And the uh, executive functions is not just one um, single construct. It's a multifactorial construct that includes distinct sub processes. Um, so it has been argued that executive functions include switching attention to the task relevant items. So I took my flu shot and then I prepared for my presentation and now I should be switching attention to effectively conducting the presentation or you know, talking about my research. Um, inhibiting any task or relevant information. So I did make sure that um, my team says on do not disturb mode, but if it was not, then from time to time I might hear ping and I would have to inhibit those task or relevant information. Updating any task relevant information in working memory. This would really kick into action when I'm answering questions and answers based on your questions. I have to update um, what I'm thinking and um, how my answer should be and also reorient and think about my research based on your comments. So um, it's much of the research, um, at least in fMRI domain on cardiovascular health and aging have focused on inhibition processes of executive functions. Um, however, age related de declines and executive function sub processes are relatively not significant for inhibition based on some meta-analysis. So prior meta-analysis by Verhagen and colleagues um, on stroop tasks and inhibition of return have found that um, inhibition abilities are no, are not process specifically. The, the age related differences in inhibition is not over and beyond what can be explained by general slowing. Um, but consistently, a lot of studies independently as well as large scale systematic reviews have found that the switching and updating processes uh, reliably show age related differences which can't be explained by general slowing. So, um, and we have found that these effects are also exhibited in brain activations. The colored, high, you know, colored references are our papers that we used as a background going forward uh, for these set of studies. So the main, of, main aim of the current study is that uh, we wanted to see if cardiovascular health influences executive functions in normal aging. 
and we didn't want to look at just one factor of cardiovascular health, um, so we didn't limit ourselves to physical fitness, but we also looked at arterial plasticity, which I'll explain in a bit. How did we measure arterial plasticity and physical fitness? Um, so arterial plasticity was measured by pulse pressure and physical fitness was measured by VO2 max. And importantly, we wanted to see how brain activations during these tasks can um, moderate these uh, direct influence of cardiovascular health to executive functions and normal aging. Most importantly, we wanted to study what are the separate effects of plasticity and fitness on the brain activations during executive functions, but we also wanted to see um, what are um, the combined effects of plastic, plasticity and fitness um, on the brain, uh, on older adults' brain activations during executive function, which has not been um, studied in great detail yet. Um, so there are two experiments for first set of studies that I will go over. The experiment one is, is actually focusing particularly on switching. Um, we used a task switching paradigm to look at different types of switch costs. Experiment two, however, looked at a more complex task where switching, updating, and inhibition all come to play. Um, so we were able to look at the combined effects or executive functions as a whole. And then if time permits, I will also want to talk about experiment three, which was in which we cleverly separated the switching and updating phenomena within the same task and wanted to look at the combined effects of switching and updating versus separate effects of switching and updating on executive function on, on in uh, healthy older adults. Um, so just a little bit of background, as I said, um, so there are no studies that have looked at effects of blood pressure on brain activations in older adults uh, for switching or updating. As I said, there have been studies on inhibition. So this, this study by Chuang et al. looked at flanker tasks and they found that um, age related overactivations were associated with worse performance in uh, older adults with high blood pressure. Physical fitness also has not been looked at for switching, particularly task switching and updating. Um, however, it has been looked at another inhibition task, the Stroop task by Hyoto et al., as well as in dual task by Wong et al. Um, so that's a paper by my lab and Art Kramer's lab. We did a um, study where we looked at, uh, we found that increased activations were observed in high fit older adults for task sensitive regions. Now the definition of task sensitive regions um, were not ba were based retroactively um, with the assumption that these kind of regions are found to be, uh, are observed in other studies uh, in younger adults when they do this task. However, none of these studies have included data from younger adults where we can actually compare in this particular paradigm that we are testing if these increased activations or overactivations that we are seeing in high fit older adults are really um, regions of um, regions that are also activated in young or they are compensatory regions that high fit older adults are activating in addition to task sensitive regions to help them perform better than the low fit older adults. So therefore, in our studies that I'm going to go over, um, we have 60 older adults um, and 28 younger adults. So we, um, we instead of just looking at older adults and looking at both um, fitness and, cart, um, and arterial plastic, plasticity's effect on older adults brain, we also wanted to look at a comparison group of um, younger adults who are our functional control. So these are the assessments of cardiovascular health in older adults. We uh, looked at arterial wall plasticity, um, which was measured by pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And the idea is that um, if the pulse pressure is over 60, then you have greater arterial wall rigidity, or in other words, less arterial wall plasticity. So if you have greater plasticity, you're expected to have pulse pressure less than 60 in older adults. Uh, fitness, on the other hand, physical fitness was uh, measured by MET, which is the metabolic equivalent of VO2 max. Um, it was um, assessed by this formula and a physical activity um, 
questionnaire called PACE, um, and uh, that questionnaire, in addition to body mass index, index, their resting heart rate of the older adults, we could calculate the MET. Um, so we did the median split of MET. Um, our, median, our median for the MET was 7.4, which is kind of high because the norm is um, 5. Um, in older adults uh, with one standard deviation. So it can vary anywhere from four to six. So we were like a couple of you know, standard deviations above than the normal. So we had a very um, healthy group of older adults in this sample. Uh, this is just a little description of the participant characteristics, which are common across the two experiments. Um, because the two experiments, we use the same participants, but they were doing different tasks. So um, the low, as you can see, um, we separated people by low plasticity and high plasticity. And when you separate uh, people by low plasticity and high plasticity, so high arterial plasticity would be the group where the pulse pressure was lower than 60, and then low arterial plasticity would be the group where pulse pressure was higher than 60. And uh, the numbers are uh, the way it is. Most importantly, the MET, uh, was not significantly different between the two groups. So this is the MET 6.83 versus 7.53. When we separated people based on the median of the MET score, so we um, ended up with obviously a very equal distribution of high and low fitness because it was divided by the median. Um, and um, although there was a significant difference in MET, which is to be expected because it's a median split, the pulse pressure was no different between the two groups. So uh, there was no significant difference between the pulse pressure. So the important thing to note is that there were no di significant differences in M MET scores between the high and low plasticity older adults. There were no difference in pulse pressure as well between the high fit and low fit older adults. So um, I'm going to now talk about experiment one and remember experiment two uses the same group of participants, the same division. Uh, so this is Shua Chin. Dr. Chin uh, did her uh, PhD uh, from my lab and uh, these are set, set of studies we did together. Um, so this is a paper that came out a um, month or two ago where we looked at influence of multiple cardiovascular risk factors on task switching and older adults using an fMRI paradigm. So these are the results from that experiment. All right, so this is the fMRI paradigm we used. We have used this paradigm in past in 2018, and it was uh, designed by me, you know, um, and you know, a few years back. So what we wanted to look at is um, use a hybrid blocked event related design um, that would allow us to not only look at the dual task cost when you have to do two tasks versus one task, which you can obtain from the block design, but you could also look at other type of costs such as local switch costs, mixing costs, and compatibility costs. So let me go over the paradigm a little bit. Um, so, and the paradigm was divided across four blocks. It's adapted from Braver et al.'s task switching paradigm. Um, However, with different type of task, it's an embedded Q paradigm that we're using. So you have 30 second fixation, then you have a 154 second of blocks and which where the trials are interspersed with um, random, you know, with variable inter-trial interval, uh, and then another 30 seconds, and then another task block, and another 30 seconds of rest, another task block, 30 seconds of rest, task block, and then finally the 30 seconds of rest. So it's about 15 minutes, 15 and a half minutes of the task overall to do the study. So you have uh, in the first we um, people had to do a high or low judgment task. So the, this is called a single task block. You only had one type of task to do. So every time you see a number on the screen, you had to say whether the number was higher than five or lower than five. Obviously the number five was not used. So the digits that we used were one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is a high low judgment task and the blue background um, acted as a cue to remind them that the blue background is for high low judgment. So if you see blue background, you're supposed to do high low judgment um, for the digit and in the first block only blue background. That means only high low judgment tasks were shown. In the second block, uh, participants had to do odd or even judgments on the digits. So now instead of the blue background, they saw a pink background 
and they had to say whether the digit that they see on the screen is higher uh, is odd or even. So again, there are four digits which are odd and four digits that are even. In the last two blocks, th those are called dual blocks. Um, so then the last two blocks, participants had to switch, had to maintain both tasks um, requirements. So they had to remember that if you do the blue, if you see the blue background, you press, you know, with the right hand high and with the left hand low. Um, if you see, you know, pink background with the left hand, you have to do odd with the right hand, you have to do even. So they had to remember both tasks loads and the way the task works works is not like a dual task where both tasks are presented simultaneously. This is a task switching paradigm. So you see one digit at a time on the screen um, attached with the queue. So the queue is the background color. So if you see the blue background, you're supposed to do high low judgment. And if you see the pink background, you're supposed to do the odd even judgment. Now the nice thing about the task switching paradigm is that it allows us to look at uh, differences. Uh, it allows us to look at switch conditions versus non switch conditions. So what does switch condition mean? So switch condition is every time you had to change switch from task A to task B. So in this case, you're switching from odd even judgment that you were doing in the previous trials. And then the moment the blue background came up, you had to switch your, you know, task parameters to uh, high or low judgment. So you had to make a mental switch to the high low judgment task and you had to say, oh no, eight is not even, eight is higher than five. Um, so those are switch trials which can go either from when you switch from an odd even to high low judgment task or from high low judgment task to odd even. The non switch trials are when two successive trials have the same task um, you know, demand. So you in this case, you have a pink background followed by another pink background. So this second trial is a non switch trial because you just did an odd even judgment and you didn't have to switch tasks anymore. You still are doing an odd even judgment for this trial. Um, this allowed us to this paradigm allowed us to look at multiple um, types of switch cost. Um, however, in 2018 paper, we found that there were only two switch costs that um, gave us reliable age related differences and um, those costs. So one of the switch costs that gave us um, age, age related differences were the global switch costs. So that allowed us to global switch cost was looking at these two dual blocks and comparing them with these two single blocks. So that would allow us to look at uh, subtracting the reaction time of the dual blocks from the single blocks gives us the global switch cost. Um, but then uh, looking at those dual blocks and looking at the brain activations for dual blocks greater than the brain activations for single blocks allows us to define global switch cost sensitive regions. And these were defined um, in the previous papers. In addition to it, we could also look at local switch cost. So local switch cost is when you look at the switch trials and you subtract the non-switch trials from the switch trials. So in reaction time, when which is how we define local switch cost, we look at switch RTs and you subtract the non-switch RTs from the switch RTs. For brain activations, the idea is similar. You look at the switch conditions and uh, you look at the brain activations for the switch conditions greater than the brain activations for the non-switch conditions. And that led us to local switch cost sensitive regions in the prior papers. So the way we um, wanted to look at the fitness effects in experiment one was twofold. One is we did the whole brain analysis in older adults. Um, so when we did the um, whole brain analysis in older adults, we could look at the separate effects of fitness and plasticity as such. So for plasticity, for to define plasticity sensitive regions, we compared the high plasticity older adults group versus the low plasticity older adults group. For fitness sensitive regions, we compared the high fit older adults group versus the low fit older adults group. Uh, the covariates used in group analysis are age, sex, and bold signal variability in all the studies. To study the combined effects of um, plasticity and fitness, or plasticity um, can also be thought about it as type of cardiovascular risk, because um, if you have a high pulse pressure, that puts you at a higher cardiovascular risk. 
Um, so we looked at two risk factors versus zero risk factors. So two risk factors would be the search scenario where you not only have um, high PSP, so uh, high pulse pressure, but you're also scoring low on fitness. Um, so that gave us um, only 11 participants who had both risk factors. Um, so, and the idea is that when we look at the two risk factors um, and look at the brain activations um, re related to those two risk factors, that would give us the combined effects, detrimental effects of these two combined factors. Uh, participants with zero risk factors were those who had very low pulse pressure. Uh, that means they had high arterial plasticity as well as they were high fit. So many of our participants um, were uh, showing but showing neither of the two neither of the risk factors so that would allow us to look at the combined beneficial effects of cardiovascular health and then equal nearly equal number of participants also showed one of the risk factors uh, so they were either um, showing high pulse pressure but they were um, high fit or they had low fitness but had low pulse pressure so that would allow us to look at the separate detrimental effects. Now, this is how the data panned out. Um, this is just to just to give a better view of how these um, you know, risk factors were defined. So these are the risk groups, low plasticity and high plasticity, and then the fitness groups are high fitness and low fitness. Um, and people with you know, zero risk factors didn't have um, you know, had low plasticity, that means low pulse pressure, sorry, not low plasticity, um, low pulse pressure, and then, um, uh, yeah, yeah uh, low pulse pressure and high fitness, this should be pulse pressure, my apologies, and then high pulse pressure and low fit were two risk factors, and then we also looked at people who had one of the two risk factors. Um, now, as I said, we had different groups. We ideally we want to have 25, 25 and 25 in all the groups, but you know, these are, um, you know, analysis done after they come in the lab and do the study. So uh, we couldn't, you know, match the sample. So what we did is that we also did a matched and um, subgroup analysis where all the all the groups had uh, 11 people in the group and we particularly compared the zero risk factors versus the two risk factors um, to be able to look at the brain regions um, that would come up in this match group analysis. Just want to say that the match group analysis looked very similar to these results, um, except for um, sometimes some of the regions were showing up at a slightly lesser threshold. So within all these resulting brain regions, we wanted to compare um, these uh, resulting brain regions from older adults to that of the functional controls. Um, and the reason for doing that was to see are there larger age differences in low plasticity group or low fitness groups. And then we also did a brain behavior prediction analysis only in older adults to see if um, these activations are evidence for compensation, um, or their evidence for uh, de-differentiation. So let me talk about the results of experiment one. Um, so these are the plasticity sensitive brain regions where we compared the low plasticity group versus the high plasticity group. Um, and we are looking at the dual greater than single contrast. And a brain region that shows up to be reliably significant is um, lingual gyrus. Um, and this uh, region is actually showing evidence for disengagement. So if you look at the high arterial plasticity group, uh, the ones who had pulse pressure less than 60, they are effectively disengaging this brain region for dual task more so than for single task. When you look at the comparison group of younger controls, you see that younger controls are also able to do that. Um, they are able to disengage this more so than when they are dealing with single task. And the difference, um, uh, here, um, sorry, difference um, between uh, these blue bars and orange bars in young adults is same as the difference between the blue bars and orange bars in the high fit older adults. However, in, sorry, high arterial plasticity older adults. However, in older adults with lower arterial plasticity, that means the ones who had higher pulse pressure, um, you fail to see this reduced disengagement. So, um, so this difference is not significant. And so you fail to see this reduced dis disengagement um, for these low arterial plasticity older adults. 
When we look at fitness sensitive rain regions, the one region uh, broad cluster that came out um, um, as a result of the dual greater than single contrast was this overactivation of left inferior frontal gyrus in low fit older adults. And um, this region is considered to be a region of conflict resolution by some and also evidence um, a region that is involved in inner speech process that might help you maintain the task loads better or maybe people are using that strategy. Um, and um, if you look at extreme detoxation, um, you uh, that would suggest that there is additional cognitive strategy in low fit older adults. So this seems to be a uh, region that seems to show evidence for extreme detoxation. Let me explain what that means. So if you see at the younger in the younger adults, this region is not activated either for single or dual. In high fit older adults, this region is not activated for single or dual. However, in low fit older adults, you see this evidence of overactivation. So low fit older adults are activating this region more for dual than single, and also low fit older adults are the ones who perform worse in these tasks. So the overactivation is only observed in the low fit older adults. Now the question is, is this overactivation maladaptive or is it compensatory? It's helping them do the task. Um, the evidence suggests that the activation in this region in low fit older adults is maladaptive and that's why we think it's an evidence for extreme de-differentiation. So this is what the results look like. So these are the mean person signal change in left IFG during those dual task blocks. So this orange big bar. And this is the reaction time um, for the for the global switch cost. So this is the difference between dual and single reaction time. So that's the global switch cost RT. And the greater the global switch cost RT, the worse your performance is. And lo and behold, you see the more the worse your performance is, the more you activate this region. So this region is not adapt is not uh, compensatory. It's not helping you do the task. In fact, the more you activate this region, the worse you perform in this task. And these correlations, as I said, are only done in older adults. Um, now, finally, to the more interesting part, what are the combined effects of plasticity and fitness? Um, so, in this case, we looked at these, um, or we looked at the contrast between the people who had no risk factors versus those who had two risk factors. And these are the ROIs resulting from those contrasts when you compare two risk factor group versus no risk factor group. Um, and then we pulled out uh, person signal change for both dual and single because the contrast was taken from the global switch cost. So both dual and single um, across all the three groups. So not only for no risk factor and two risk factor, but also in one risk factors to see if um, any results are monotonic in nature or not. Um, and you can see in blue the results from subgroup analysis. It's just that the region is a little smaller, but they overlap, um, you know. In, with the same region. So what we see consistently that the, is that the combined effects of the two factors is greater than effect of one factor alone. So this is um, lingual gyrus. Um, as we said before, this is a region that shows, um, you know, a reduced, um, you know, reduced uh, disengagement as we have more risk factors. So if you look at Older adults have no risk factors. They are able to disengage this region greatly for dual compared to single. But then as you have one, one risk factor, you are able to do it, but not as effectively as before. And then when you have two risk factors, you're not able to do it at all. There is no significant difference between the R. Um, and all these differences are significant. All the pure wise comparisons are significant. Um, if we look at the left IFG, which was a region which uh, which was a fitness sensitive region, so lingual gyrus was a, a plasticity sensitive region and left IFG was a fitness sensitive region from the previous two slides. Um, and again, we see this monotonic effect. Um, so people who have no risk factors are not you know, recruiting this region at all. And remember, younger adults also didn't recruit this region. Uh, people with one risk factor are now um, recruiting this region for dual, but you know, not for single and people uh, and older adults with two risk factors are again not, um, you know, activating this region for single, but they are activating it even more so for dual. And there is a significant difference between the dual task activation um, for the dual task activation between the two risk factors group and the no risk factors group, as well as for one risk factor group and the no risk factor groups. However, the combined effects is not greater than the effects for one factor only. So it's not as if the combined effects were significantly more than the one risk factor, but we do acknowledge that um, this 
um, is a study where um, there were you know very few adults in this group, so we we take it with a grain of salt and what we want to focus our attention is the monotonic mono, monotonic relationship um, that as you increase the number of risk factors, you are um, showing an increase in activation um, of this region, which is not is which is maladaptive in nature because the more you activate this region in older adults, the worse you perform is related with worse performance in the task. Um, so just a summary of the results from experiment one, uh, we find that the high cardiovascular risk was associated with the reduced disengagement in link of lingual gyrus. Um, particularly, uh, we find that low plasticity older adults we think may have impaired inhibitory control mechanisms in their, uh, during task switching, which is leading to this reduced disengagement of um, lingual gyrus. Low physical fitness was associated with increased overactivation of left IFG, and it's possible that low fit older adults may be utilizing additional cognitive strategies and attempt to maintain the performance. However, uh, this um, attempt um, to uh, this possible recruitment of cognitive strategies is not adaptive, it's maladaptive um, for the performance. So it seems that the more you recruit this region, uh, the adult, older adults who recruit more of this region also show reduced performance. So this seems to be the evidence for maladaptive compensation or dedifferentiation. Um, and finally, we found that the combined detrimental effects of fitness and plasticity were greater than um, the um, effects of um, high risk alone on the brain activations during task switching um, and no differences were observed between the high cardiovascular health older adults and younger adults. This suggests that age related differences in activation from these regions are completely attributed to cardiovascular health um, of older adults in our study and that's kind of very impressive. So, um, so that that was great that if you have high cardiovascular health, if you have no risk factors, uh, not only your performance was matching. If you looked at the D prime that was matching uh, our accuracy, it was matching that of the younger adults, uh, but we also see that the brain um, activations look the same. There is no significant difference between the uh, high cardiovascular health of older adults and younger adults. So that was end of experiment one, and um, I, I know we are all waiting for questions after the presentation. So um, I'll go to the experiment two now. So experiment two was also looking at these cardiovascular risks or cardiovascular health, uh, but in this case we were looking at how these um, how cardiovascular health can alter default mode network disengagement during executive functions in healthy aging. Now we used a different task in this paper, and it's a paper under review right now. Um, so we wanted to look at um, you know, a task which involves not just switching, but also updating an inhibition. So we wanted to look at executive function as a whole. And by looking at executive function as a whole within the same participants, we can understand if task complexity modulates effective plasticity and fitness on brain activations by comparing experiment one and experiment two's results. So the paradigm used here is um, a block design task. So you have these uh, two runs of um, six task blocks and uh, seven rest blocks, and each task block was 30 seconds um, long. So the task overall takes about 13 minutes, 12 to 13 minutes to do. And uh, the, the task is a modified NBAC task. So it's, uh, in other words, it's called random NBAC task. We published this um, task um, in 2020 um, in neuropsychologia. And what you, what we did in this task is that you have um, two streams of numbers, so the numbers can either come in yellow color or in pink color because they're just very bright. That's why we chose the color against the black background. No other reason for doing so. Um, and they had a response window of 1500 milliseconds to respond to the task. Um, and um, the first two numbers are encoding only trials. You look at the four, you look at the eight, you try to keep it in your mind. But then after that, um, every time you see a number, you have to say if the number is same as the number before in the same color. So in this case, you're comparing four with the four before in yellow. And in this case, you're comparing eight in yellow with the four yellow. Uh, but then when the number two comes up, now you have to say whether this two is same as the last digit in pink, which was eight. And then when you see the next two, it's very easy now because the last number you held was two. So you just quickly go and say, oh yeah, I saw two before. 
So critical comparison and these tasks um, are update trials and not update trials. Update trials is when you have to override the previous information in your working memory. Uh, um, so you basically are updating the item that you're holding in working memory for the pink stream of information for future comparisons. Because if you fail to do so, then when the next two comes up, you might end up saying, no, they don't match because you're still keeping eight in your mind. And non-update non trials are something like this, where you have um, you, you don't have to update the previous information, or something like this, where you don't have to update the previous information, where the numbers are still the same. You just say that the numbers match and you move ahead, but you don't have to update the information. Um, so the task involved updating, the task also involves switching. So you had to switch between uh, the pink and the yellow, um, you know, streams of information in a random order. This was a random and back task. That means the two streams of information are coming in random order. And then there was also a lot of proactive interference in play because uh, sometimes the number you see now in a different color also matches the number you're holding in your memory, uh, but in a different color. Um, so you also have an obituary control uh, that is involved in this task. So the nice thing about this task is that um, it's a complex executive functions task which involves all the three sub processes of executive functions, make, namely updating, inhibition, and switching. So in this experiment, we did whole brain regressions um, instead of the split group analysis um, because, um, you know, that was more appropriate to do uh, given the data set. Um, we also want to say in the previous analysis, the results were replicated when we did the whole brain regression. So that's in supplementary section of the paper. Um, so in this paper, we just went ahead and just presented the whole brain regressions in older adults. Um, so we looked at plasticity sensitive regions. Um, uh, so we looked at plasticity, arterial plasticity, and how it predicts brain activations during the task. We looked at fitness and how fitness predicts brain activation in this task, so we could find both plasticity and fitness sensitive regions. And then we also created a composite score of plasticity and fitness um, that could allow us to predict brain activations. And this would allow us to look at the combined effects of plasticity and fitness. And again, like before, within these regions, resulting regions, we wanted to also um, pull out data for these regions um, in younger adults to see how does the younger adults brain activations look like for these resulting regions, which were either fitness, plasticity sensitive, fitness sensitive, or looked at the combined effects of plasticity and fitness. And so again, um, like before, we wanted to see if there are larger age differences in low plasticity or low fitness groups of older adults compared to high plasticity or high fitness groups of older adults. Um, so these are uh, the results from the study for plasticity sensitive brain regions. We found two different regions, both anterior and posterior cingulate. Um, and uh, both regions um, are typically suppressed during tasks. Uh, they are considered to be regions of default mode network and across many inhibitory control tasks, including flanker, you see, um, you know, ACC, for example, um, showing greater suppression in younger adults and th those, um, sorry, increased um, dis uh, greater disengagement of this region. And the more you disengage this region, the better you perform in the task. So um, as you see in younger adults, both um, in both regions, the younger adults are uh, disengaging this region um, for the overall task. But if you look at the high plasticity group, they are uh, that means the people, individuals, older adults with pulse pressure less than 60. They are also are in this case, it's not a split group analysis, but in general, people who had lower pulse pressure, uh, you see that uh, they are also able to suppress it. So uh, we pulled these ROIs. They are from continuous regression, but just for purpose of showing it, um, it's easier to see the two different groups based on that, you know, high low plasticity. Um, and you can see that um, people are high plasticity groups are disengaging this region more so than the low plasticity region. Um, and then the question is that uh, is this disengagement beneficial for your performance? So what we found is that um, across all individuals, um, you know, and again, regressing out the variables that we talked about in the first experiment, we found that the mean person signal change um, in ACC as well as in PCC was significantly correlated with mean accuracy. So the more you disengage this region, the greater your accuracy is. 
and uh, there was significant uh, differences between the uh, young adults and high plasticity group for these regions, suggesting that there are age related differences in the second in disengagement of this region in both high and low plasticity group, but importantly, the high plasticity is is not as severely um, affected as the low plasticity older adults. All right. If we look at the fitness sensitive brain regions, again, these were re these were regions identified from the whole brain regression analysis. We found anterior cingulate. Um, as we said before, anterior cingulate looks like a region of um, DMN and reduced disengagement of this region is usually associated with better performance in the task. And um, again, like the previous slides, what we saw is that um, this we are just for purposes of showing we're splitting people into high and low fit group just because if we show the same regression, what's the point? Because that's where the ROIs are taken from. Uh, this is just to show that both young adults and high fit older adults are able to um, disengage this region. However, low fit older adults are not able to disengage this region. Again, uh, the more you disengage this region, um, the better your accuracy and there's a great overlap between this region and the region here. So that's not a surprise that we see very similar results, except they're from different contrasts. Again, we see a significant difference between high fit older adults and young adults. So age related differences in disengagements are found for both high fit and low fit groups. And those these results are strikingly different from the task switching paradigm. Uh, where we had not found a significant age difference between the high fit and the low and the young adults or the high plasticity and and the young adults. Um, let's also look at the combined effects of plasticity um, and fitness. So the region that we find is um, more posterior cingulate and as expected, this is a region of disengagement. So younger adults are disengaging it a lot. Um, older adults who uh, have less risk, that means they have high plasticity and high fit uh, and are high, fi high, high fit. Um, they tend to also disengage, uh, but not as much as the younger adults. And as you can see, this monotonic, monotonic relationship like we saw in the first experiment is maintained that the more risk factors you have, uh, the less you are able to uh, disengage this DMN region. Um, and again, like before, the more you disengage this region, the better your performance is. So in other words, reduced disengagement in older adults with reduced cardiovascular health was observed, especially for those with two risk factors who are not able to uh, disengage this region at all. Um, now, this combined effects of plasticity and fitness, um, it's not very clear whether these combined effects are greater than the individual effects of these factors. So we wanted to know whether the combined effects of these two health factors are greater than individual effects of these factors, uh, like we had done in task switching. So to address that, we did stepwise regression analysis for this PCC disengagement as a de dependent variable. And we had two different models, one where we wanted to look at combined effects and compare it with um, plasticity only, and then the fitness model where we looked at the combined effects and tested whether it's greater than the fitness effects. Um, so this is the uh, step one where we are, uh, you know, uh, regressing on pulse pressure and pulse pressure is significant as expected. But then when you look at combined effects, of met and pulse pressure, uh, we see an R square of um, seven, um, seven percent, which is R square, not R, so R would be higher, and so um, seven percent difference between this model and this model, uh, suggesting that the combined effects are greater than plas plasticity effects alone on the PCC disengagement. Uh, the same story goes for fitness model, except the difference is much more striking here. Uh, so MET alone was a significant predictor of this region, but MET plus PSP, when you add the pulse pressure to the MET, now you have um, an R square increase of 27%. Um, so the combined effects are again greater than the fitness effects and PCC disengagements. So the summary of results too, um, very clean summary for results too, both plas low plasticity and low fitness were related to reduced disengagements in DMN regions. Um, and these were anterior and posterior cingulate cortices. The combined effects of plasticity and fitness were greater than the effects of either factor alone on the PCC disengagements. 
All the significant age related differences in activations were observed in all older groups. Um, it is important to note that older adults with worse cardiovascular health showed exaggerated age related differences um, in activations from these two regions. Um, so for discussion, um, we find overall across the two experiments that decreased cardiovascular health, either low arterial plasticity or low fitness um, negatively impacted brain activations and task performance in older adults. Um, and more importantly, um, the observed age related differences in fMRI studies that have done been done have been conducted so far may be attributed to increased cardiovascular burden in older adults, um, especially in regions of dedifferentiation um, and task complexity modulates the effects of cardiovascular health benefits and executive functions in older adults. As we saw, as the task got more difficult, it was um, harder to uh, override the age related differences and brain activations, which was possible in a much easier task, which involved only switching aspect of executive control. Um, so um, I will quickly go over the last experiment which we are submitting. Um, so here we wanted to look at only physical fitness and protect to see if physical fitness can protect aging brain against age related declines and um, both updating and switching mechanisms of working memory. Um, so the main questions we wanted to ask is fitness a neuroprotective factor against age related declines in cognitive control. If so, are some mechanisms of cognitive control more sensitive to these protective effects of fitness? And do these effects vary with the increase in cognitive control demands? Um, so there are three cognitive control mechanisms that we wanted to look at. One was proactive versus reactive control. The other was updating versus non-updating, switching versus non-switching, and then combining the cognitive control mechanisms of switching and updating. And I will, for the interest of time, just focus on the first and last. So the paradigm is a novel paradigm, um, which is, um, you know, uh, hybrid block design, um, event related and block design. And the advantage is that with this new paradigm, unlike the previous paradigm, we are able to isolate trials where you don't have to update and you don't have to switch. Um, so for example, the six here where you don't switch and don't update because it's the same as the number before in the same color. Um, and um, or you have to just switch, but you don't have to update. So this is similar to the NBAC, but we used colors similar to the task switching paradigm um, to you know, compare, make it easy to compare across the two tasks. But the idea is that you have to say whether the number you see now is the number is the same as the number before in the same colors as so the same and back task. Um, and then the switch trials, but you didn't have to update. So you saw nine here. The last one was blue, so the blue nine. So you didn't have to update the information, but you still had to switch because there were intervening trials in between. We also had the update, but you don't switch. So here um, you had to you know, update the information to nine from five, but you didn't have to switch. And then finally trials where you had to switch um, so now you have to go back to the last pink you saw. So this is you had to switch from blue to pink, but then you also have to update the information moving forward because six is different from seven. Uh, we also had unpredictable set of uh, stimuli where items were coming in random order of blues and pinks are predictable where you have two blues followed by two pinks followed by two blues followed by two pinks. So the idea is that the predictable condition engages greater proactive control. You have to plan in advance versus unpredictable is more reactive control. The stimuli comes up and you react to it depending on whether it's pink or blue and predictable paradigm. You can plan in advance and say, oh, the next trial, the next item I'll see is blue or the next item I'll see is pink. Um, so just very quickly, um, we screened a lot of participants, but final group of participants, we had 40 participants, um, 13, uh, 12 high fit, 13 low fit, and then 15 young adults. And the two, the three groups of the two groups of um, high fit and low fit participants, we did an extreme group analysis. So we pre-screened a lot of people, and then we divided people into high and low fit based on the uh, intense um, exercise, moderate to intense exercise level and physical um, exercise questionnaire that we gave to them. And so we pre-divided the participants. And uh, of course, the division might not be effective. So we looked at the MET score and lo and behold, the two groups are indeed significantly different um, in the MET score such that high fit have higher MET than the low fit. 
Um, this is just to show behaviorally the results. So if you see the low fit older adults, they are um, they have lower D prime and they also have lower hit rates. So this is unpredictable trials and these are predictable block of trials. In both cases, the high fit versus low fit is significantly different, uh, but there is no difference between the high fit older adults and younger adults. So you can see that the hit rates of high fit older adults and younger adults are same irrespective of the condition, both for unpredictable and for predictable condition, but the difference between the low fit and high fit older adults is really exaggerated. And the D prime shows similar results. And these are results from switch cost, which just shows that um, you cannot get rid of age related deficits and reaction time. Uh, as you get older, you do show deficits in reaction time, um, uh, which cannot be mitigated in some cases. All right, so um, there are many regions that we saw. We saw regions which showed maladaptive overactivations in low fit older adults. Um, compared to younger adults or high fit older adults who were not involving this region during proactive control condition. We also saw evidence for compensatory overactivations in high fit older adults. So they were using middle they were engaging middle occipital gyrus during both versions of tasks, suggesting additional recruitment of some kind of visual coding. But most, uh, most importantly, I wanted to focus on this condition. So there was one ROI left MFG that we found, which was um, in the contrast of updating and switching conditions compared to the baseline, which is non-switch, non-update, and we compared the high fit and low fit older adults. And this is very interesting. We found that the main effects of condition and group were significant, and what we see here is that um, uh, in, the in the low fit older adults in blue, they do not change. The brain activation is remaining fairly constant across these blue groups. Um, if you look at the orange groups, which are high fit, they ramp up. Not they don't need this region to be involved during the simplest condition, but when they are switching, they ramp it up and then they use it for updating as well as for switch update. And then if you look at younger adults, they don't need it for the simplest condition, but they need it while updating and then they ramp it up as well for switch and update. So we think that we, this neuromodulation that we see um, with increased cognitive control is not just function of age, which is what um, crunch model um, talks about, but is also affected by fitness level. So I'll uh, stop here and thank my lab. And uh, if anybody has any questions. Thank you thank so you much. So Chandra. Chandra. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're waiting for questions to see if uh, any come in, but while we're waiting, I have a question for you. You mentioned in the first two studies that you presented, it was the same sample. Um, and I'm curious, You, I think you also mentioned that they were relatively healthy older adults. So I'm wondering if you had older adults who were not as healthy, how you think that that kind of group of unhealthy older adults would fit in compared to the results that you showed? That's a great question, Kendra. So l most of the studies in past have actually looked at those extreme group samples, right? So so most of the studies that have looked at fitness have looked at people who are high fit, like you know, really high fit were past athletes or uh, and then sedentary older adults. And they find this marked difference in the brain activations. Um, we wanted to see if even, even within a restricted range of healthy aging where none of our older adults were past athletes, <laughs> they were just high fit. They were going to uh, J going to JCC, taking some, you know, yoga or, you know, some uh, light intensity classes. Um, and so were our low fit older adults as well. So they, we were all recruiting all the participants from JCC and surrounding communities. Um, and so they were just taking different levels of activities, um, but nobody was sedentary, but nobody was also like, you know, super high fit. So we wanted to see the kind of sample that we many of us do aging study like all of us who do aging studies maybe this is a more representative sample for us right so the question we wanted to see was whether this in uh, over activations that we see in uh, aging studies can that be partially attributed to cardiovascular health and the same goes for blood pressure most studies have looked at hypertension versus you know people older adults who don't have hypertension but just to look at the group of people who have maintained their hypertension either through medication or 
um, just don't take medication, but they all had blood pressure on or less than 160 over 80. Um, so that was 160 over 90. Yeah. And do you think that the the results would differ? I guess what I'm thinking about is it would, exag um, it would be exaggerated. Yeah, I mean, if anything, you know, like um, you know, we we should we should still see that fitness and cardiovascular health helps mitigate those age related differences. So the last study we did, we explicitly went out and hunted for these high fit and low fit older adults. Again, not sedentary. Um, yeah. Their MET scores are still higher. I mean, you know, around three to you know six for you know people in low fit group, um, but they're more comparable to the you know general sample when people say MET score should be less than five. Um, and there we see this markedly different um, activations, right? We see this compensation also kicking in, and we see that their performance is bang on. I mean, you know, they, we looked at the performance in so different ways: deep prime hits, false alarms. It doesn't matter what. And even in some of the reaction times, we didn't find age-related differences. Like for switching, we didn't find age-related differences. Uh, sorry, fitness, uh, high fit, and younger adults did not show any difference um, in switch cost, for example. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions coming in on the Q and A, and we're past 1 p.m. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Chandra Malika, for coming today and being our first virtual uh, virtual presentation for the Brown Bag Lunch. Uh, and we'll look forward to the the other presentations we have in the coming weeks. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, Kendra, so much for giving us this opportunity of tying all these studies together. <laughs> Helps with any grant writing. And if anybody has any questions, please reach out to me and we'll be able to tell you. You guys, Everybody has these kind of data in your lab. Um, most people have measures of blood pressure, but also some questionnaires and fitness um, that you know, we, we are happy to share with you. Great. Thank you, Tana Malika.